Have you ever asked yourself the question, what do I do when my World War II aircraft is on fire? Well, I have, and I'm here to tell you what you have to do. The information in this video relies primarily on the United States pilot information file. This means two things. First, this information was widely distributed to American aviators of World War II and can thus be considered as part of their training. Second, the information contained is meant to give you general advice and will not fit every event. Specific advice for each aircraft would be given in additional pilot manuals. On top of that, this advice is largely applicable to multi-engine aircraft but can also be extended towards single-engine planes. Also, while this is an American document, we can consider it to be generally comparable to most other nations' manuals. Also note that for this video, we assume that your aircraft is currently in flight. If a fire breaks out during flight, communication is key. Fire needs to be reported to the pilot immediately. The crew itself should be aware of fire protocol and fire extinguisher locations and immediately combat the fire if possible. Indeed, combating fire takes priority over all other tasks. The pilot will decide what course of action to follow. If flying low, he is advised to climb and gain as much altitude as possible. The crew will be instructed to ready parachutes and stand by. In case a fire cannot be contained, the plane should be abandoned. But let's get a bit more specific here and assume that you're part of a bomber crew merrily flying through German flak. No German fighter is to be seen and all you hear is simply the steady thump of 88mm shells going off all around you. In short, nothing out of the ordinary, life is good. Suddenly, your engine gets hit and it's on fire. What happens now? If you are lucky, your aircraft has built-in fire extinguishers. Such devices were installed in some World War II aircraft engines, fuel tanks or in the amphibian hulls of seaplanes. By flooding the compartment of carbon dioxide, a fire extinguisher starves the fire of oxygen, extinguishing it. These extinguishers should be used immediately after the fire is identified, as they are only adequate against small fires. Additionally, whether you have extinguishers or not, shut off the fuel supply of the affected engine. Open the throttle wide and open all available emergency exits. After extinguishing the fire, land as soon as possible to determine the cause and extent of fire damage before continuing. Of course, this advice will only serve to complicate matters when flying over enemy territory, so you might as well just ignore it. In the event of a wing fire that does not affect the engine or the fuel tanks, the following advice is given. Electrical systems such as landing or navigation lights should be turned off. Emergency exits need to be opened once again. The pilot can attempt to combat the fire by sideslipping his plane away from the fire. Should the fire continue, the pilot will decide whether a landing is attempted or the plane abandoned. Note that the sometimes referenced emergency dive to extinguish an external fire is not mentioned in the pilot information file. But what happens when the fire is a bit more up close and personal? Perhaps your cabin is on fire. In this case, close all windows and turn off the ventilators. In case of an electrical fire, turn main switches off. If fuel or oil is leaking, shut off the valves. In case of ignited flares, immediately release all flares. Beyond that, the fire should be immediately combated with handheld fire extinguishers aimed at the base of the fire. Now the United States used two different handheld fire extinguishers on some aircraft, a carbon dioxide based one and a carbon tetrachloride extinguisher. Other nations had similar devices. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. In a nutshell, the carbon dioxide extinguisher is to be used on fuel and oil fire. The carbon tetrachloride extinguisher is to be used on fabric and wood fires, with a carbon dioxide extinguisher as backup. As carbon tetrachloride develops toxic gases generally suboptimal to the crew's well-being, 
the cabin should be ventilated immediately after use. Direct contact with both substances should be avoided. Now this was general advice based on clinical scenarios far away from the reality of frontline combat. Remember that fire on board is a bad thing and often the fire wins. Some of the advice given here will work better or worse depending on the situation, but it gives you a good idea of what should be done in case of a fire on a World War II aircraft. Of course, for the more hands-on types out there, you can always ignore the theory and do what RAF flight engineer Norman Cyril Jackson did in 1944. After one of his Lancaster's fuel tanks was set on fire by a German night fighter, a wounded Jackson strapped on a parachute, took a fire extinguisher into his own hand and leapt onto the wing. Just before reaching the engine, he was knocked off the wing, charred and burned parts of his clothing on fire. Falling 6,000 meters, that's just about 20,000 feet, with nothing more than a smoldering parachute, he nevertheless survived the ground impact. As a prisoner, he was treated before internment. While his bomber never made it home, four out of the six remaining crewmen survived. For his action, he received the Victoria Cross in 1945. I wonder what the authors of the pilot information file would have to say to that. Support me on Patreon and share this video if you enjoyed it. If you would like to know about survivor bias and World War II aircraft, click on this video. Or if you would like to know more about a hardcore variant of German night fighting, click here. As always, have a great day, good hunting and see you in the sky.